Good morning. It's nice to see you guys, and it's an honor to be here on a Friday. And um, I'm so glad that we were able to work this out to get to come in to work with kids in Billings classrooms. And this will stand in today for a classroom, but what a wonderfully rich environment for kids this is. So we're just honored to be here. Um, Ashley Saylor is the fourth grade teacher that's hosting us today. And I don't think Ashley's quite in the room yet, um, but I visited with her. If you don't, do you all know Ashley? If you do, I'm sure you're blessed by it because I've enjoyed working with her over the past few weeks planning for today. We've been communicating back and forth. I'm going to tell you a little bit of background about Ashley's classroom and who we'll be working with today. We'll take a walk down there before we say goodbye to Ponderosa so you can see her actual room environment and see what she's got going. Um, she has strong habitudes in place for independent practice and application that are going to be very helpful to us today. And we've decided to do a few things um, through visiting with Kim, based on your input. We want this to be as authentic as possible, but yet we're filming, so we have to balance that. So we'll do the whole, whole group interactive reading lesson for the day that Ashley's students would authentically be in today. So we're not messing up the journey of the kids. We're in unit one, week three, day three, because Ashley took some time to put the structures in place for independent practice and application, she's not, uh, per her words, on the track of where she would want to be time-wise, but that isn't a negative thing. It's absolutely cool. We want to build the building before we ask kids to do anything in it, so um, she's done that. After we do the whole group interactive reading lesson, we'll do two small group differentiated lessons for the day. You would normally do four or have four, or maybe do two and confer in a couple or something like that. Um, but for the sake of filming today, we're just going to <coughs> film two small groups. Ashley's students sort of coalesce in an interesting way. There um, is no group in the class that's been identified to match with the advanced text and support in LEAD 21, there are two intensive groups, one strategic group, and one benchmark or grade level group. So per Kim's input with us in planning, I've decided to do um, the intensive group that would benefit from the most mediation and support, and the benchmark group. So you'll see groups from both <coughs> continuums. The groups have names. The first is called Let's see, I love their name, so I want to say it. The first group we'll work with is the Bobcats, and the second group we'll work with is the Pink Panther. <laughs> Another question that's bubbled up from your group is about getting started with inquiry. And when my colleagues are in town next week, what is day is it, Trey? Wednesday. 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 They're going to be uh, talking about the inquiry strand in more detail. But per Kim and my co-planning conference, we're going to do something a little inauthentic today in that after the small group rotation and that time for cross-tech sharing, I'm going to do what I would do on day one of the inquiry lesson, just getting started, the generation of questions and possible answers or conjectures. And that way you'll get a taste of how we're moving to inquiry. In an authentic setting, it would actually be week one, day four, or day five that you'd be seeing the beginning of. So that'll stretch us a little bit this morning for kids to be filmed that long is a lot to ask of uh, people who are 10. And then they'll go back to the visiting teacher and we'll have a reflective conversation here for a little while, then we'll go to lunch. And then I think we're reconvening at Lincoln Center in room, how organized am I? C. Five four R. Although I can't read, is that right? Two thirty four R. Wait, let me put my glasses on. <laughs> my who is the C? Yeah. Two five four R. Do you know where that is? Two thirty four R. So up that half of past my office. It's a three. Up, up half the we'll be there. staircase. What the heck? So Desiree's old tilt room. Does that help you? Twelve forty five. And we won't stay to the end of the day by any means. We'll just. Uh, generate questions and talk about those questions in an open forum. Is that all right? And when we're cooked, we're cooked. 
So let's talk about how I would plan. Um, I hate to, to do this, but you asked me to come and do this, so I'm just going to talk through. And I think you guys are, um, you know, you're the best of the best, or you wouldn't be in the room. You're, you're the folks that are coming, going to go back to your ranch and be ambassadors for, for the work we're doing, so that's a good thing. Um, I know that there are a lot of questions amongst our colleagues about pacing and it's impossible to fit all this in and it's too much and there's too much on the buffet and there's some angst and frustration as there would be with any new resource. And with the implementation of the Common Core this is going to happen even more. So I'm going to just make a suggestion that my colleague Steve shared with a group last week when he was in town with technology for two days and that is if I were planning, if I was a fourth grade teacher at Ponderosa, when I started Unit 1, I might, in week one, take the weekly assessment myself <coughs> before I plan it, so that I can begin with the end in mind and know what Common Core related skills and strategies I really want to focus on as I decide what to emphasize and what to de-emphasize in my instruction. I'm not saying leave in, leave out, I'm saying because I know the outcomes of what I want to cover in this crucial period, I'm going to emphasize these pieces based on what the kids bring to the dance. That will vary from each classroom to each classroom. But it gives me a, a clarifying lens to think about what I want to emphasize as I'm moving through the instructional sequence. I might also look at the benchmark differentiated unit assessment as I'm planning so that I could see over the course of four weeks what the big ticket items for instruction are going to be. And up to that point, I'm always going to plan first from the unit perspective, then from the week perspective, then from the day perspective, then to the whole group or small group perspective, so that I get an idea how what I'm doing today connected to yesterday and how it connects to tomorrow. Some of the frustration, I don't mean to start on the deficit, but some of the frustration that teachers might be experiencing is because LEAD 21 is built on um, a few beliefs about literacy instruction that are research-based, but they are beliefs. And one of those beliefs is in the importance of recursive instruction, meaning I touch something, and then I let it go, and then I come back and touch it again, and then I come back and touch it again. I build to mastery over time. If a teacher approaches this resource with an orientation that's slightly different than that in their belief structure, say a, a reading mastery belief structure, where I'm going to teach this specific strategy or skill to mastery in this initial interaction, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, I'm just saying then I'll be frustrated because it doesn't feel like we stay long enough with anything for it to come to mastery. We're building a patina of layers versus, it's kind of like when you spray paint. We're not spray painting one heavy layer, we're doing light strokes multiple times and then we get a better finish when we're done. Does that make sense? So. That's something that, that I think about as I plan. I know the kids aren't even going to know this vocabulary word, or this suffix, or this strategy in the first interaction, but by the time we touch it multiple times, we will. So I want to share again, after I've looked at the unit, after I've looked at the week, after I've looked at the weekly assessment taken at even, and looked at the unit benchmark assessment, I'm a big picture guy. Now, you guys may be different than me in the way that you process, but I'm just inviting you into my head this morning, and it's a pretty scary place. Can you guys smile at me for a second? Just, <laughs> we're all right, right? We're good. Okay. So, so this is where I start. I start with the big pieces for the day. And this is just online. I'm online in real time with the Ponderosa Internet Connection. And I'm looking at the e-planner, not the detailed planner, but just the overview for the day. And I'm saying to myself, even with Kim in the room, even with my boss in my room, I feel good about my time with Ashley's students today if I've touched these big pieces. 
I'm practicing fidelity to core, fidelity to the resource if I've touched these big pieces. I'm not going to eat everything on the buffet today because I'll be sick. I just want to make sure I have something that matters from each of the categories on the buffet. And these are the buffet categories. So today, as we're working with the kids, we'll be asking, what is my heritage? That's the big question for the four weeks. So I'm going to scaffold for myself, just as I would as a new teacher with Right Group Lead 21. And in the back of the classroom here, I'm just going to jot down my theme question for me. And this, I'm just coding it so I know that's the theme question. I'm going to keep that up so I can come back to it. Now in Ashley's classroom, she has a question wall that she's using to generate her um, inquiry stuff over time. And she could well glance, it's actually at the back of her classroom, she could well keep that at the top of her mind. That's what we're wanting to do this morning. Now, since we're in the third week of instruction, there's a, specific, uh, there's a specific question that's a focus question for the week, and that's what kinds of things are passed on through generations? So this is the focus question, and I'm just going to write it for myself. I apologize for my handwriting. And those are the questions that are going to be specific to the small group interaction and kind of part of the whole group piece. So I want to keep that at my mind. Then I want to take note that we're building some, just going to keep them on, that um, we're building some vocabulary for everyone, shimmer, competition, and boundary. So just on my notes. I hope this isn't too uh, operational, but this is the way I scaffold for myself. And someone asked to see how one person does it. Those are the words I want everybody to have as we're through this interaction today. That will be my benchmark for success. Then the big, um, excuse me, the big kind of piece that we want to recognize or vocabulary strategy is metaphor. So I'll be honest, I'm 50. So sometimes at top of mind, I don't have the difference between metaphor and simile in my head. So I'm going to scaffold for myself this morning. A metaphor would be something like um, Juan is a rocket. Okay, and I'm just I got that right out of the teacher's guide, and I'm just going to keep in my head is a, not do the like and get into simile land. I'm going to stay in metaphor. You know, Kim is a gift. Is a, and that's what we're going to use. So I'm going to just put for myself blank is a blank. And that will help me remember that as I'm working today, I want to make sure metaphor comes up. For comprehension, we're working not on a strategy but on a skill. And I think about Reggie Rotman's sort of definition of. Strategies being those big pieces, like Ashley is working on, she shared this morning very quickly. There's one strategy we haven't touched yet. Was it determining importance? But all around her room, she has those six or seven key explicit comprehension strategies that are part of LEAP 21 and embedded in the Common Core 
determining importance, making inferences, asking questions, and so forth. So the only one thing her kids haven't touched strategy-wise is that determining importance piece. But we're focused on a skill which is a more discrete or finite building block of strategy that has to do with thinking about sequencing and how authors use sequencing. And if I'm teaching this from a common core perspective, I'm going to think about the connectivity between reading and writing, the connectivity between different kinds of text and genre, and how sequencing could be a piece that reaches across a writer's tools and what we find in text. As a matter of fact, since if we're thinking about the common core here, the three C's of the common core could be collaborative conversation. So I want you to watch today to see how many times I ask Ashley students to engage in collaboration. To make mm, that would be the first C. The second C would be close reading with citation of text evidence. And uh, Standard number one, anchored standard number one, the first two words are read closely. And so close reading is that literary criticism model that involves reading the text first and then going back in with specific purpose repeatedly. And some teachers in Billings are frustrated with Lee 21 right now because we touch the same selection 19 times. That's a common core related pedagogical underpinning of touching the same text multiple times for different purposes. Because that's what proficient readers do. And that's what the Common Core asks for. It feels a little stilted, but that's what we're doing. We're going to go into the text this morning and think about how the authors of the text that we're in used sequencing to accomplish the third C, we'll do collaborative conversation. We'll access complex text, because in the whole group interactive reading time, we're going to use a biography of Cecilia, Cecilia Cruz, sorry, which is complex text. But we're also going to think about accessing complex text from the perspective of the common core, which what we're uncovering in the training in Billings is probably there are certain elements of text complexity. Am I going too fast, Kim? Am no, I okay? You're fixed. So it was the first C was collaborative conversation. The second C was close reading with text evidence. The third C is complex text or accessing complex text. So Celia Cruz's biography this morning is the complex text that these fourth graders are going to be swimming in. And we're engaged in a close read because Ashley's already read the text once with the kids. And we're going back in with a specific purpose in mind. Does that make sense? <coughs> Our strategy that we're focused on in the main is to recognize how the author uses sequencing to help us access the complex text about Celia Cruz's life. Because recognizing sequence or text structure is one element of text complexity identified by the Common Core. If a biography was told in a sequence that was different than chronological, it might be more complex than a piece of text that moves in a linear, ordinal way. Is that making sense? Trying to embed the pedagogy of the Common Core under what we're thinking about today. So we're doing, going to do sequencing. Now, there's a literary element, and I'm going to just go, I have metaphor, then I'm going to go sequence. And we'll send for the kids if I run a little bit long here. Is that okay? And then, um, then there's always a literary element taught, which is a good thing, every other week. So it might be, you know, we focus on one kind of thing one way, but a literary element the next week. Obviously, we wouldn't do literary elements when we're in informational or nonfiction text. We might do text structure, you know, or something like that. So it's Friday, and I'm 50, and I'm in Billings, and I landed at 10 to 12, and it's foggy this morning, and I've only had this much coffee from a styrofoam <laughs> cup. So I have to think. You look fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, Trey. Uh, so 
<laughs> my wife said to me, in this lesson are sound devices. And I don't know about you, but when I just saw sound devices there for a second, I couldn't bring to surface what are we teaching today. So there are two, onomatopoeia, okay, and alliteration that we're sort of um, focused on today. And so I want to just remind us as we go into the text that we're um, sort of looking at it yeah, means a word that imitates a sound. So like uh, boom, crash, right? Okay, and then alliteration, of course, broke in with that. So we're going to focus on those two things. So I'm just going to put uh, O for onomatopoeia and um, alliteration, A for alliteration, and I'll remember what that means, I hope. And then we're going to look at what we would do for word study in phonics. We're going to look at some suffixes. Now I know, because I have a bulk of instruction in my mind, and judging from the interaction that I've had with Ashley about the strengths of her students and our interaction this morning and observing your walls, the word study piece will probably be shorter for me today but I'm going to review a set of words that have specific suffixes, and they are words, and I'll have to use the teacher's guide to see them when I get to that point, but they are words uh, with suffixes A-L, A-B-L-E, um, fool, us, adjective suffixes. So words like traditional, joyful, enjoyable, famous, foolish, you with me? So we'll kind of go there. And then um, <coughs> we'll do Homophones or homophones? Somebody tell me what those are. Different spelling, different meaning, sound the same. So we'll touch that a little bit. And we'll also, as Ashley's kids go into independent um, practice and application, they're going to be employing the fluency passage in the practice companion, which is focused on expression today. So how we change our voices to share our feelings. So that's an overview of the whole group lesson. And I think that's good to get us started this morning. Now as we do the intensive and the benchmark lesson with the Pink Panthers and the um, Bobcats, um, we're going to find that the lessons for the level text or differentiated readers focus on many of the same things that we've touched on in the whole group. It's just that nice that way. I know we've seen each other a bunch of times and one of my favorite sayings is what I get when I squeeze kids is what they've been soaking in. So I've marinated the kids in sequencing, in uh, adjective suffixes, in uh, all of these elements will be seen in the small group lesson. Does that make sense? And in both of these lessons, we're going to be in um, narrative this week. This one is the intensive lesson. It's called Adult Story. It's about, in a nutshell, for you third and fifth grade people that haven't taught this. That sounded rude. Wait, can we rewrite that? For our practitioners in third and fifth grade that haven't taught from this grade level, this is a, since it's a unit about the passing on of cultural tradition, the essence of this story is this is a doll that's passed down through generations, and so it's one way stories told and tradition is told and all of that. And then um, the story in the advanced text is Plain Jane, and this is the story of a young lady who's um, engaged in sort of entomology or word study around 